coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord? held 
got a communion there with you, I encourage you to pick that up and grab it. I got a few words I feel like God was wanting me to share, but like we remembered that the juice represents his blood poured out for us. The precious blood of Jesus. And that wafer, stale as it may be, represents 
his body broken for us. And so let's fix our eyes on Jesus. But my question is, who is Jesus? And not who he is to you. Who is he truly? Because it's not what we make of him. He is who he is. It's what he makes of us. You didn't make Jesus. He made you. There's a heads up. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the precious lamb of God. Jesus is the lion of Judah. Jesus is the I am. John the Baptist says when he sees Jesus, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's not what we make of Jesus. It's what he makes of us. He is who he is. We'll hear more about it in the sermon, but we're happy being a dodgy shack of a home if you think about your life. But Jesus wants to make a palace of our lives. He wants to do something remarkable in and through you. So let's let him make something of us as we take communion. Recently, he healed me of a bitter heart. He wanted to make me a free creature. And I think he wants to do something in you as well. He wants to redeem and restore and make new. That's what he does. That's what Jesus does. And so he is the answer to your problem. You can't fix these things on your own. Jesus can. So we're going to remember as we take communion today, we're going to remember him who poured out his blood for us, him who broke his body for us, the precious lamb of God. Let's turn and follow his way. Let's look towards him. So I encourage you, take, just take communion as you feel led as we start to sing from this point. But think about Jesus as you take it. We're doing this all together. All of us in this place, we're fixing our eyes on him. The bread of life, the light of the world, the way, the truth, the life, the precious lamb of God, the line of Judah, the I am Jesus. We're fixing our eyes on him.
shall reign. some people here today where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and there is freedom. And just a simple picture for some people here today. You know, next week we celebrate Easter. Today's Palm Sunday. But but when Jesus went to the cross, they actually wove a crown of thorns and they placed that crown of thorns upon the head of Jesus. And literally the, the, the thorns would, would pierce His brow and blood flow down. It's a graphic picture. But He did that so that we could wear a crown of peace. Like, like thorns represent sweat and toil. They were the thing that, that God said that Adam would spend his life that would work against him. And I feel like there's a word for some people here today and your mind has been anxious and worried. 
And in fact, I had this, this picture in, in the first service that there was, might be some people here today and, and you've been struggling to get free of some thinking. Uh, in fact, there are some young men who, who, who have been believing God for freedom for pornography. And, and you're here today and you're like, man, I, I wanna be free of that. Can I tell you that Jesus can actually set you free of that? Come on, come on. There are some young people here today. In fact, there are some people here today who, who've struggled to sleep at night. They've struggled to find rest. And, and, and I wanna tell you here today, the Bible says God gives His beloved rest. And you know, I grew up on a farm and I would often uh, work out in the farm. And one day, one of the sheep that were on the farm was caught up in a barbed wire fence. And this sheep was struggling to get free of this barbed wire fence. And we went to help it get free. But the problem was this sheep, although it needed freedom, the more it struggled, the more it fought, the more tangled it became in the barbed wire. And so we couldn't help it until it actually settled and stopped fighting. And then we were able to cut the barbed wire and set this sheep free. And I feel like today the invitation of Holy Spirit this morning is that we will find rest in Jesus and trust our heart to Him, just as we were worshipping Him, as King Jesus, crowning Him King Jesus. You know, He, he wears a, a crown of victory. Like He's crowned in heaven right now. But He actually, when He was on earth, took this crown of thorns, paid the price so that we could have freedom of thought, peace of mind, freedom from anything that would bind us. And so today, I'm just gonna believe God with you that there is gonna be something that breaks over people's lives right now. And so if with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you need something to shift in your mind, maybe it's maybe just, just something you believe in God to shift, just lift up your hand right now. And I wanna pray for you. Come on, just lift your hands nice and high. If that's you, come on. There are people all across this room who just need, God, I need something to shift in my thinking. I need freedom in my mind. What does, it doesn't matter what it is, large or small, there is freedom in the Name of Jesus. And so we come together today and we, we partner with You, Holy Spirit, and we thank You right now that there is a moment of freedom for some people here today who are reaching out their hands and saying, I, I can't get free of this thing myself. I'm bound up and I need a work of the Holy Spirit in my mind. And so I pray for a rest to come across every mind. A rest of the Holy Spirit that even this week you would stop fighting to be free and you would trust the finished work of Jesus and the Spirit of God by His power and His might would bring liberty and freedom to captives. Come on, and if you believe that today, let's come on, let's put our hands together and celebrate the power of Jesus here in this place today. Come on, come on, I just know. I just know He is in the business of setting people free. Amen. It is so good to have you with us in church today. You can just grab your seats and we can bring the lights up a little bit. And it's just so good to be together. We have our, our friends, Josh and Taylor with us. Tyler, thank you so much for leading us through communion. Isn't this guy a great man? We love you, mate. You're awesome. Awesome, guys. Well, uh, I want to encourage you to turn your attention to the screen. If you're new to our church, uh, we're going to check out some of the ways in which you can connect in to the life of our community right now. So let's check out what's happening at Anthem. It's so great to have you join us today. We find people have three questions when they are new to our church. How can I know God? How can I get to know some other people? How can I live my life to make a difference? If you're new to church, we want to help you know God. At the end of the service today, some of our team will be near the door to your right as you exit the auditorium. They will have a Bible for you and can help answer any big faith questions you have. If you'd like to get to know some other people, our connect groups and connect points are for you. They provide smaller settings in various locations around the coast that can help you grow, learn and belong. So be sure to ask our team or check our website for more details. There are also a few ways you can help to make a difference through our local church. You can complete our short online orientation video that will help you connect and contribute to our Anthem team of volunteers who serve in many different ways. 
you can give financially to support the ministry of Anthem Church as we serve our community and reach the world with the message of Jesus. You can pray with us. Prayer makes a powerful difference in people's lives. To your left as you exit, you can write your prayer needs on a blue post-it and pin it to the wall. When God answers your prayer, write it on a green post-it and share the good news with us by pinning it on top of your prayer request. You can also join us weekly on Tuesday mornings between 6am and 8am to pray for the needs of others and for the people in our community. Take any of these next steps by scanning the QR code on the card in the back of the seat in front of you or fill out the card and leave it with us at the Connection Hub in the foyer. If there's anything else you need, feel free to speak with any of our team. Excellent. Awesome. Come on. Uh, There are plenty of ways you can connect into the life of the church. If you've uh, got those cards in front of you, you can just take that out, scan the QR code. It'll take you through to a whole lot of stuff around our church. I'm really excited about a new church website at the moment. We've freshened it up a little bit. There's some really clear pathways for people to make decisions, uh, who've made decisions to follow Jesus, to go on the journey of uh, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jeff, uh, has led the creation of a New to Faith short course, which is just so good. I'm so grateful to have evangelists like Jeff in our church putting that content together. Uh, we've got some amazing... Yeah, come on, give it up for Jeff. Uh, obviously, there, there's some amazing things happening in Connect Groups, which I'll get Ben to share about in, j- in just a moment. But also, there are so many ways in which you can serve across our church and in the life of our church. You know, next weekend, I expect that we will have you know, anywhere between 750 and 1,000 people in our services across next weekend um, because that's, that's usually what happens on Easter. Usually double our weekend attendance is, is here at Easter. And so there are so many opportunities to reach people, but, but it's, it is a weekend where it is a little bit, hey, all hands on deck. So even if you're not on our volunteer teams officially, next weekend there is a part that you can play to help us. And so please speak to uh, Jeff, Gary, Ben, any of our team about the ways in which you can help next weekend because, hey, it's, it's, I believe it's harvest time. We've seen over 50 people make decisions to follow Jesus since the start of the year. And I just know like Easter is coming and it's a time where people are ripe and hungry. And so let's believe God as we come together uh, that we're going to see souls saved and reached and then discipled. Uh, And so Ben, do you want to just take a moment to tell people how they can connect into the groups of our church, which are absolutely firing? Uh, Go for it. They are. Josh will tell you his connect group is the biggest. biggest. That's because he he rounds up his numbers, but that's all right. (laughs) It's 21, definitely 30. Um, uh, No, there's, there's... Oh, that's great. There's, there's 24 actually in our group. Um, no, I'm kidding. There's so many ways, so many groups I could tell you about, um, and I won't do that this morning, but two, two things I want to tell you about coming up in term two. Uh, when I was 25, we were expecting our son, Elijah, and there was a man in my life who I'd seen how he raised his kids, and it was a beautiful thing. And so I went to him and said, you know how you've raised your kids, and you know, you like them, and they like you, and they feel free to be who they are. He said, yeah. I said, how did you do that? Because I wanted to know, how did you do the thing that I want to see in my life? Yeah. And to this day, some of the wisdom he gave me in his garage, I still use to parent my son. Because someone who'd gone before me, who I saw in their life something I wanted, I asked them. This term, next term, um, Mora. Where is Mora? Mora has been walking with the Lord and in ministry for over 50 years. And if you talk to Mora, she still talks about him and the Bible and prayer as if she's just discovered it. She has a genuine and deep love for the Lord. And she's written a course called uh, Roots to Grow and Wings to Fly. And what that course is, whether you're a lady or a man, it's, it's not a ladies group. It's for anyone who wants to learn how do you actually engage the Bible in a way that brings life to your Christian walk? Um, how do you walk with God and pray and learn how to pray? How do you learn to develop a vision or a purpose for your life? All of those sort of things that we hear about are important for your Christian walk. Mora has not only written a course for it, she lives it and has been living it for a long time. And so I would highly encourage you, if those are things that you want to grow in, if you look at Mora and say, I'd love to love Jesus like she does in another 20, 30, 40 years, why not join the group she's running and let her teach you some of the things the Lord has taught her and flourish your your Christian walk. Um, And then the second thing as well, my wife, Melinda who I love dearly and who's also a nerd, if you get to know her, a beautiful nerd. Um, She wants to start a ladies uh, book club reading Fervent. It's a book on prayer. 
And so rather than just be people who think we should pray, why not learn together to pray? And so our prayers can be effective. Um, I, I got to have dinner at Joel and Hershey's the other night and it was fantastic. Joel and I had a four hour conversation and we could have kept going. Um, we didn't take a breath, we just kept talking. But we talked a lot about the Lord and about theology and our understanding of our faith. And I realised sometimes I love to learn on my own, but it's such a joy to learn and grow together. And so when we can come together and discuss what's important to our faith, it sharpens you in a way you can't do on your own. So if either of those two things um, are, are something that have piqued your interest, please jump on the website, ask to get in contact with the leader and they will be in touch with you to let you know details. So there are two things coming up next term. Thanks, mate. Come on, hey, why don't we thank Ben and all the Connect Group leaders who do such a great job uh, keeping our church community uh, well-connected, resource, disciple, and growing. Hey, uh, we are, con- speaking of connections, we are uh, connected to, uh, uh, firstly, we're an Australian Christian Church's church. If you didn't know that, we're an ACC church, part of that denomination and movement. We're so proud of what God's doing through that movement of churches. But we are also in relationship uh, th- with a church in America uh, who really helped resource and support us in ways behind the scenes that are so such a blessing uh, called New Spring Church. And Josh and Taylor have recently just moved from New Spring Church in South Carolina uh, to Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and they're here with us this weekend. And uh, I actually have the privilege of being coached by uh, Shane Duffy, who is the church planting uh, pastor and leader at New Spring. And he's the person responsible for uh, supporting and commissioning and releasing Josh and Taylor into their new church plant, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And he watch, he tunes into our services most weekends and always talks about how much he loves our church. He's going to come to Australia soon and we're going to have him visit us. But he's got a little short video by way of introduction that I want you to uh, hear from him as we kick in uh, to this next moment. We're going to talk a little bit for a few minutes about church planting and then Josh is going to bring the word. So why don't we check that out today? Thanks. Hello Anthem Church. Uh, My name is Shane Duffy and I'm one of the pastors at a church called New Spring over in the state, specifically in the state of South Carolina. And I just wanted to say I am so thrilled uh, to be a part of your service today for two reasons. One, I get a chance to celebrate what God's doing at Anthem Church. I've gotten to know Pastor Josh over the last couple of years, and every time we talk, he's always celebrating something new that God's doing in and through the people of Anthem Church. And I just want you to know that we are cheering you on uh, from halfway across the world and just celebrating all that God's doing there. And especially, I just want to honor Pastor Josh and Renee. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, they're, they're just amazing people. It's amazing what God's doing there. They're so gifted and talented and you guys are so fortunate uh, to have them as your pastors. And we just want to say we honor and bless them and are so thankful uh, to be in relationship uh, with such good, uh, godly, uh, diligent, disciplined uh, and compassionate kingdom minded people. It's just amazing what God's doing there. Anthem Church, just know this, what God's doing there, it's not normal. It's a supernatural thing. And we just celebrate that uh, with you. Also, I get the chance today uh, to, to, to celebrate uh, one of our own, one of New Spring's own, uh, coming over to preach for you today. Uh, you know, about eight years ago, Josh and Taylor Bull moved from Australia. I'm calling them one of our own. Actually, they're one of your own. Uh, they moved from Australia to be a part of our church about eight years ago. Showed up young, uh, no kids. And they're leaving uh, eight years later uh, with two, two, two kids who are amazing, Eli and Zane. And they just become a, a great uh, family. Uh, God's used them in ministry. He's grown them up. He's gifted. And he's called them to come back to Australia, specifically to Melbourne, to start a new church called Society Church. And our church is 100% behind them. We're backing them. We're working with them to get them set up there in Australia, but they're going to need your help too. They're going to need Pastor Josh's help uh, because it's a tough thing to to start a new church. But we believe God sent them there on mission to return to their homeland and see the kingdom expand, specifically in Melbourne and even throughout the greater uh, land of Australia. And so uh, I just wanted you to to hear from us. We love uh, Josh and Taylor. We love what God's doing in them and we're behind them 100%. And so we hope you enjoy uh, your time at Anthem today, and I also hope uh, that you get a chance to connect with Josh and Taylor and hear a little bit about what God's doing in their lives. Awesome. Hey, isn't that great to hear that from uh, Shane? Hello, Anthem. Yeah, why don't we thank Shane? Uh, 
Hi, Shane. He usually watches. Um, hey, I'm going to ask if it's okay, uh, Josh, Taylor, Zane and Eli, if you guys want to come up on platform really quickly with us. And Taylor uh, wasn't with us in the first service, but Taylor, uh, it's so great to have you here with us as well. Do you mind taking a moment to just share with us a little bit about what God's going to do uh, and your heart for Melbourne and Society Church? Thanks, guys. Thanks, Josh. Hey, Anthem. It's so good to be with you. I see so many familiar faces. Um, Shane mentioned it, but we we were part of this church about 10 years ago when it first launched. So, so much of this weekend has felt like coming home and seeing so many familiar faces. Although now there's so many new faces. I, you know, there's a hundred, hundreds of people to meet, but truly I've just been blown away with what God is doing here. Oh, you want to say something? Hello. Hi, Eli wanted to say hello. Um, so yeah, so we are moving to Melbourne and truly like so much of our story started here at Anthem. So we just, you want to say something? Oh, beautiful. Um, I started here. So we're headed to Melbourne and we're on this crazy adventure and trusting God. And um, we just know that. Yeah. Wow, amazing. We're just trusting God that he would bring people to our church and people would meet Jesus. So, yeah, so we'd love you to be part. Hey, can you pray? Can you say thank you, everyone? Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Stay up here for one minute, guys. Uh, you know, it's funny. When we were planting, uh, we were part of a, a campus plant from another church. We moved up and Joel was this age and Laura was about this age and Josh would sleep in our lounge room and our kids were very bold like these pastor's kids and he would be like, gee, I don't know, uh, you, you guys could be better at disciplining your children. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just say... What you sow, you reap. <laughs> I'm joking. No, no, it's a great season. But what, a, what, a, what? A, there's three ways that we can help support these guys as they go to plant this church in Melbourne. And as pe- somebody who's been a part of pioneering two churches now, it is it is not easy, and particularly with little kids. Um, and they need all the support they can get from us. You know, as a church, we take the first ten percent of everything that comes in through our tithes and offerings, and we send it out uh, to make a difference in the world. Three percent goes to international. Ministry. Missions, 3% to national missions, 3% to local missions, and 1% goes to missions in the, the nation of Israel. But the, out of our national missions budget, uh, we are going to, as a church, support these guys as they plant their new church. And so uh, you are already supporting what God's doing, but there are two other ways. You, you can also give directly to them through that QR code on the screen if you'd like to support them in any way. But there's two other things we can do. We can, we can pray. We can, we can give. And the third thing I really felt to just ask today, you may have a heart and a burden for the city of Melbourne. And uh, you may actually be in our church and say, you know what, I, I want to go and pioneer a new church in a new city. Um, and I, I would love to just release people into that. I would love to bless and release people to support these guys as they plant new churches because that is the kingdom of God. It's not about planting churches with our last name on it. Amen. It's actually just about seeing the kingdom advance in new cities. And so I'm going to ask right now uh, for one minute. You guys are doing a great job, by the way. You're doing so good. I'm, can I ask Pastor Bill and Bev as, the, as really the apostolic leaders in our city to just come and lay hands on these guys and we're going to pray for them as a community. Can we stand and do that as they go and plant this church, I believe there's something that God's just wanted to impart into them as leaders uh, today. Renee, you can join us as well. Thanks. Uh, come on. You're right, Bev. We got gotcha. you. Thanks, Bev. Thanks. Got gotcha. you. All right. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Yeah. I love to see the kingdom of God being expanded. And I know God's hand is upon this beautiful couple and uh, that God's going to use them in a great way. Lord, as a family, we stand together, united to not only share our prayer and support, but Lord, to commit ourselves personally, Lord, to pray and Lord, to really get behind what you are doing in this great nation, especially now in Melbourne. Lord, we just commission both these precious couple and this whole family, Josh and Taylor and the children, we commission them, we set them apart 
and I declare in the anointing of the Holy Ghost come upon him. Lord, the prophetic mantle will rest upon him. In the name of Jesus, let such an anointing, Lord, flow through his being that, Lord, he will touch many lives, that your glory will be revealed. So, Lord, give them both the giftings that they need. Lord, in the power of the Spirit, and bless the children as they grow up. Father, anoint them in a mighty way. We declare it so in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Come on. We're able to help Bev. You help Bev. Cool. You can take your seats, everybody. Uh, it is so great to have these guys with. Thank you for giving us a little bit of extra time today. Who's enjoyed this so far? We, we've dedicated children to the Lord. We've worshipped together. Uh, we have uh, taken time to just pray and get behind a church plant. And right now, my good friend, Josh, is going to bring the word today. Can I ask you just let's get behind him. Let's support these guys uh, as they bring the word. So why don't we give it up for Josh as he comes and preaches. Josh, you're amazing. Thanks, bro. I appreciate it. Thankful for you. Wow. <laughs> it's an absolute honour to be with you guys today. And I was uh, saying this earlier, um, this is very much a, a full circle moment for, for me. It's, it's uh, nearly 11 years ago, I packed up my little Toyota Echo from Melbourne and uh, drove all the way to the Sunshine Coast to be a part of uh, really this community here and with Josh and Renee and I was just a kid really and, and just seeing all that God has done over the past 11 plus years uh, in, in this community is just so humbling and uh, I was just thinking earlier, I was looking at the carpet and, and remembering uh, 11 years ago, uh, the carpet tiles that we would put out in this basketball court uh, at this school hall uh, for about eight hours on a Saturday. Like, who does that to start a church? But we did. And, uh, and, but just remembering those moments of living in the basement of a, of a, in the mother's room of a church building. And that was a part of my compensation package that, uh, to be the, the youth pastor at the time. And uh, that was really all it was, is the compensation package. But, uh, but truly, that... that that chapter of my life radically changed my life and, and any quote unquote wins that I've seen in my life, I look back on that chapter of my life as a formative moment and to be here today is extremely humbling and so I just have the greatest honour for Josh and Renee and the whole team, Pastor Bill Bev, everyone, can we make some noise for the pastors, the founders of what's happening here and I... Uh, uh, it's just amazing to be a part of this community and any wins that we would see in, in Melbourne for the Kingdom of God, you guys are playing a part of that. And I was just thinking about, man, like, where are all of you 10 years ago? You know, it's like, man, it's amazing to see this life-giving community of all that's uh, taking place here. And if you're new to this family or it's your first time here, man, you can trust this house. You can trust what God is doing here. And uh, as we come around the Word of God, I, I pray that it'll be an encouragement to you. Uh, this is not about Josh Ball and me. This is all about Jesus. And I just believe there's a purity in this house. And, and I, I felt this even in worship as hopefully this is an encouragement to you. I just felt like God say to me uh, they're, they're, to remind me of the name of this house anthem. And I, I just believe uh, that, that God has, has seen the faithfulness and the steadfastness over the past 10 years, particularly in Josh, Renee, the whole Bradford family, that there has been trials, tribulations, hardship that have faced. But I believe God has said, this is people that I trust. There is a purity in this house. And there's a sound that will ripple from this house that I believe will touch the nation and the world. And, it's, and God has said, this is a group of people that I trust. And this is a group of people that I, that I will give and multiply. And so I believe you're in a multiplication season. And so I just encourage you, wherever you are, take another step in because there's good people that don't want to be reached in this city. We want to see Jesus lifted high and uh, you're a part of an amazing house. So can we thank God for all He's doing? And uh, grateful to be here today. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, I'd love you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 is where we'll be. And uh, we're excited to come around the Word of God together. And if you're new to the faith or you don't follow Jesus, man, I'm grateful that you're here today. I hope that you would see Jesus a little bit clearer. And I pray for every single person in this room that you'll raise your expectation around a moment like this as we come around the Word of God. Here's what Matthew chapter 4 says. From that time, verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, say immediately. immediately. They left their nets and followed him. If you're taking notes today, the title of our message is simply titled, The King and His Kingdom. And I would encourage you to take notes. Uh, they say that a blunt pencil is, is better than a sharp mind. Uh, I believe in a moment like this, God might speak a word of encouragement to you. You may want to write it down. And uh, they also say, you don't need notes to get into heaven, uh, but why ask the question? You know, that's, <laughs> that's uh, absolutely theologically incorrect. Don't, don't believe that at all. But uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to come around the Word of God. The King and His Kingdom. Let's pray. Father. God, I thank you for a moment like this. I thank you for this house. I thank you for um, just your faithfulness. God, I thank you for this community of faith that have gathered together. And we, as we come around your word, I pray that we would see you clearer and I pray that you would move. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We are, yes, as everyone has now seen, we're in the midst of transition in a moment. A uh, couple weeks ago, we flew literally around the world from the United States to Australia with those two little boys. And you saw in a five minute moment what it's like in our family. Imagine traveling around the world with those boys and 12 suitcases and you're trying to get on planes and sit them in a little confined place. So it wasn't my greatest moments in life, I've got to be honest. It's, uh, there was a little bit of sin in the bull household of a little bit of anger and frustration, but by the grace of God, we made it and uh, we're excited to be in Australia. But I, I learned a lot about America over the last seven years and, and uh, love my time in America. Has anyone ever been to America out there as a way of hand? Wow, what a well-traveled room. This is, a, this is a, a well-established room. Any actual Americans out there? Wow, look at America, represent. Okay, my people, well, hopefully don't get offended with about what I'm about to say to you. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I love America. I, I'll never forget the moment jumping off the plane into America and me and Taylor order a bowl of nachos. And uh, it may as well have been a swimming pool that appeared on the table of just abundant nachos. Like it's like the Americans love quantity of food. That's the first thing I learned. They love just any food. There's a lot of it. Second thing I, I learned is the abundance of refills. Like if you order a Coke, you're going to have seven by the end of that meal. It's like it's, it's, it's an abundance of Coke. No wonder I put on 10 kilos within 12 months. It's like I'm living in the land of the free. It's like they, they love their, their, their food, but Americans love America. I learned really quickly something, just an interesting observation is uh, they will claim to be world champions at national competitions. <laughs> that, that they will play football, they'll play baseball, and it'll just be them and their country playing. But if they win, they are world champions. It's like... <laughs> Why don't you let the Japanese who are phenomenal at baseball take you on at some baseball, you know what I mean? Is, is there fear? I don't know. Don't say that to an American, they'll get offended. But the, the thing that I learned about America is they love America, but not only that, is they're phenomenal at indoctrinating children. My son Eli uh, passionately believes he's an American. He, he uh, could tell you the Pledge of Allegiance already. It's like he's nearly three years old. But uh, one of the things about my boys is, as you saw, a little bit strong-willed, uh, that they are unafraid to tell me when I'm quite unquote wrong. So Eli over the last year or so will be correcting me for my accent. He'll be telling me, Daddy, you're saying the wrong words. He's not afraid to tell me uh, the difference of, of my pronunciation is wrong. And I thought I've just over the last year or so just been recording these little moments where I find a word or an argument. And I would like, wanted to show you a video really quickly of the difference between an Aussie dad and American boy. So turn your eyes to the screen real quick. We have a problem with my American boy, don't we? Yes. He's not talking like an Australian because we're reading books right now and this word right here You can all see that is a lasso How do lasso. you No, it's a lasso. lasso He's turning into American. We need to get him back to Australia. Are you American or Australian? Always American <laughs> We have a problem with my American boy, Always don't we? American. Yeah. It's, it's, he's a passionate young man, but you know what I said to him? He said, I'm in charge. We're getting you back to Australia. It says, we're going to raise an Aussie, Aussie boy. And, uh, but there's that idea, man. They, they love America. There's, there's not only that, but now I'm in Australia now noticing there are distinct ways of the Aussies. There's distinct characteristics of the Americans and the Aussies, but I've just learned this to be true that there are distinct characteristics of the kingdom of God, that there is something that makes us 
uniquely who we are, that no matter where you find yourself in the world, you have brothers and sisters in Christ. There is something that makes us a part of something bigger than ourselves. And in this next few moments, I wanna come around the teaching of Jesus in the beginning of His ministry and look at what it means for the King and His kingdom to be at hand. There's something about the kingdom of God and we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. Philippians 3 says this, but our citizenship is in heaven. From it, we await a Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, that no matter your nationality, no matter where you reside, if you are a professing Christian, you are a part of something bigger than yourself. You are a part of a kingdom of heaven that is, makes the way in which we live different for a moment. I wanna come around the words of Jesus and look at what He would teach of where we are to live. And I believe every single person, young or old, guy or woman in this space, will be impacted as we come around the words of God and look at what it means for the king and his kingdom. Jesus, when he's beginning his ministry, is coming and making a declaration. He's coming and starting to preach, but the way in which the king starts his life is probably very different to maybe if you and I were in his shoes, how we would start, quote unquote, his ministry. There was an expectation for the Messiah to come one day. There was an expectation of the Jews in this day for maybe what they expected of to obliterate and to take over the world, yet the Saviour of the world comes in a very different way. I don't know, when you think about a king, what comes to mind? You probably think about royalty. You probably think about the elite. You probably think about them in, in, in exclusive places. But yet the King of kings and the Lord of lords, how does He begin His life? The Saviour of the world would do what? He would come into the meek setting in a manger, be born of a baby, as a baby, fully God yet fully man. And he would grow up in a very quote unquote average family. His dad a carpenter, he would grow up and around the age of 30 years old, he would begin his ministry. His father would say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He will go off into the wilderness, tempted and trod and out he comes beginning his ministry. The Saviour of the world coming to serve the world. And what is His message? If I were to walk around this room today and put a microphone in your hand and ask you, could you please tell me in one sentence, what is the message of Jesus? How would you respond? Would it be that it's to do morally good things? Is it to be a good neighbour? Is it to maybe not sin too much? What would be your response? Jesus is very clear that He says this, in verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is essentially His message in a sentence. This is the conclusion, of His big thing for us to take away is that the kingdom is at hand. And I've come today with a very simple message, but I want to lift our eyes to see the reality that the kingdom of God is at hand. Hand. I think often we miss the significance of the message of Jesus that Christians, I, I look around, particularly in the Western world, can kind of find themselves almost living purposeless, that they've missed the significance of what it means for the kingdom of heaven to be at hand. And when we miss the revelation of what it means for the king, king and his kingdom, we can walk around purposeless and lack meaning today. And so I ask you the question, what does the kingdom mean? What does that mean for us? And Plain and simply, I would say this, that the kingdom is the rule and the reign of Jesus, that He is King and He is Lord, so therefore He, has the rule, he is ruling and reigning on the earth, that He has defeated death and is alive and is seated in heavenly places and we get to be a part of His kingdom. It is here and not yet. We are a part of bringing the kingdom of heaven, pushing back darkness, and we as followers of Jesus come from a victorious place in him. But how does a king act? How does a king live? Kings don't wash feet. Kings don't meet with the marginalized. Kings don't meet with those pushed back by social standards. But this, my friends, is the way in which Jesus lived. He met with the broken. He met with the hurting. He met with the people that society would say, how dare you interact with them? But Jesus came as the greatest servant of all. This is our king, my friends. And He has come today and His message still rings true to us today that the kingdom of God is at hand. 
Ephesians 1 says this, that in verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above the rule and the authority and the power of dominion and above every name that is named and not only in this age, but in the one to come. Today's a significant day in the life of the church calendar. This is Palm Sunday. This is where we fix our eyes towards the cross, where we see and look as Jesus begins His journey towards the cross. What is Palm Sunday about? Him riding on a donkey, ultimately going towards the cross. The King has come in a humble way to pay a price for humanity, to bring the kingdom at hand so that you and I can be a part of something bigger than ourselves, And he, my friends, has defeated death and is alive. And that for us today brings us great hope. No matter what you're facing, no matter the hardship that you're walking through, the difficulty that you have, today you can simply fix your eyes again, remind yourself of the King and that His kingdom is at hand. But that first word in his statement, it says repent. I think so many of us, when we hear that word, can feel a little bit of shame, can feel a little bit of, man, I've missed the mark again. But that word in its purest form means for us to change our thinking. Change your ways. Change your thinking that I think often when we think about Jesus and we maybe say, yes, I am a follower of Jesus, we maybe have a quote unquote ticket to heaven one day, but we go on about living our life, the way we want. We do our things. We have the relationships we want. We treat money the way we want. We treat how we will serve the community. We want, we are really the Lord of our life. But if we come and look at this, that the kingdom touches every aspect of our life. But often I think when we miss the significance of the kingdom, we start to build empires unto ourself. That maybe you want to go and build that business just for yourself. Or maybe you want to go and chase success by the world's standards because of yourself. But when you come and see the beauty of the kingdom of God, it changes the way in which you live. Because if you look throughout history, my friends, whether it's a little empire unto self or big empires of of history, what has taken place? They will all crumble. But the kingdom of God will last forever. Empires will crumble, but the kingdom of God will last forever. So the kingdom brings purpose. This is what Jesus is doing. He say, hey, you're a part of something bigger than yourself. And I felt this so strongly in the lead up to this week as I was praying for you and praying for this community. Maybe some of you feel like you're wasted space. Maybe some of you feel like you're broken goods. Maybe some of you feel like you lack like meaning and purpose. But my friends today, the message of the kingdom rings true for you and there is space for you and purpose for you that you are not wasted, you're not broken goods, but the Redeemer is here and He's come today to seek and to save that which is lost. And I pray that hope would rise amongst this community and in this city that you are not the defeated ones, but no, you're the victorious ones in Jesus. This is not the exclusive club for the elite people who dress a certain way and act a certain way, though this is for all people. I think that so many of us kind of sit back and sit on the couch pointing, say, man, it's for those people over there. I love to play a game with my buddies uh, uh, and now I'll play it with you too. Is uh, if you could be a professional athlete at any sport in the world, What would it be? Thinking about the money, the lifestyle, forget about your physical attributes, just by pure choice, what would it be? Yell out some sports at me, come on. Golf, rugby union, okay. We're back to rugby land, what else? Tennis, Tennis. okay, I like it. Is is there any water polo people out there? I don't know, what a weird lifestyle that would be. But do you know, sorry if you're a water polo fan. But the things that I've learned is that we can often, man, think like we've still got it. I still kind of think I've got it on youth, youth spaces. I'm always ready to kind of take on the teenagers. My body's getting a little bit older now, but I still got it. Even though I'll tear a hamstring, I'm going to do- dominate in those spaces uh, because I think I can still do it. Also to shout out the youth ministry and young adults, we saw five people give their life to Jesus on Friday night. God's doing great, great things here. But I like to think about, man, what would, be, what would I do if I could be on the field? because I've kind of find myself kind of sitting on the couch having an opinion these days. And some of you are the classic kind of cheerleader on the, on the couch saying, man, back in my day, we were way more harder and tougher than those guys. Like some of you have an opinion on, on how, what the coaches are doing. We sit on the sidelines saying how you should live. But 
We can sometimes think that's the exclusive people over there, but my friends, the kingdom of God is for all people, that you don't have to sit on the sidelines of the couch, you're not sitting over there, but Jesus is saying, hey, there's space for every single one of you, your background, your story, we are all a part of the kingdom of God. It changed my life starting to follow Jesus, and I pray it would follow you. Maybe you've been following Him for your whole life, but following Jesus is a daily decision. It's a daily decision of surrender. It's a daily decision of obedience to saying daily, Jesus, I will follow you. Let it touch every aspect of your life. Let it touch your relationships, your friendships, the way you speak. Let it follow every aspect of your life and watch as you live with a new step of purpose today. But Dallas Willard, he says this about the greatest issue that we're facing in the world. The greatest issue facing the world with all of its heartbreaking needs is whether those who by profession or culture are as identified as Christians, if they will become disciples, students, apprentices and practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from Him how to live the life of the kingdom of heaven into every corner of the human existence. Will they break out of the churches and actually be His church? Will it be His mighty force for good on earth, drawing churches after them towards the eternal purpose of God and on its own scale, there is no greater issue facing the individual human being, Christian or not. My friends, following Jesus is not about ticking off a box on a Sunday. It's not checking checking off of your religious to-do list. No, my friends, will we make a decision saying, Jesus, I wanna be a disciple of you. Jesus, I want to come and follow you. Jesus has announced his kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then what is the next movement that we read in this text? Jesus says to Peter and Andrew, Andrew, would you follow me? And simply I've come here today to say two words to you, but it has profound ramifications is, will you follow Jesus? The world will want you to follow in its ways. The world will want you to follow in different directions. But again today, would we as a community of faith say we will follow Jesus? He is the ultimate one that we will follow. There's a lot of things that Jesus could have done to bring his kingdom. He could have clicked his fingers. He could have said, I'm here. Blow the trumpets. Let the world know I'm in charge. You all listen up. But no, he announces his kingdom and what does he do? He says, I want to partner with my creation, the Imago Dei, the ones made in my image. I want relationship. I want to do life with you. I want you to come and follow me. And that call to follow goes out to Peter and it goes out to Andrew and it goes out to you and me today. Will you follow Jesus? So Ernest Shackleton was a famous Arctic explorer in the early 1900s and He would go and find new land and there's said that there was an article that went out with a big advertisement looking for men to come on these expeditions with him and thousands of people would respond to this advertisement. And here's what it said, that it's said to have said. This is what the ad read. Men wanted for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, Yet safe return is doubtful. Honour and recognition in case of success. Signed, Sir Ernest Shackleton. Why did thousands of people respond to this call? Why did thousands of people say, yes, I'll join you on this adventure? It was because of the one who made the call. If I would say to you all, hey guys, I've heard that there's new land for us to go and explore. If we just all head west, would you come and follow me? I know I'm the tall guy on stage. You're kind of liking my energy a little bit. And you're like, hey, yes, I will come and follow you on this new adventure out west. And I say, guys, don't worry. I'll take care of us. Like I'll make the fires. I'll kind of cook us the food. I'll hunt. I'll do what you need. If you were to come and say yes to that call, I'd say you're an utter fool because I don't know really how to make fires. I don't really know how to hunt. I'm the guy who's on YouTube looking, how do I start a fire? Like, I'm not that kind of guy. I'm, I'm the guy that is gonna to look to you and say, please, sir, teach me how to do this. Like, I, I, I'm not that kind of guy. Because you know why people respond to certain calls? It's because of the one who makes the call. And my friends, the call of Jesus has gone out to you and I to come and follow Him. You read all throughout the gospel accounts, Him looking at people saying, would you come and follow me? And Peter and, jo- Peter and Andrew are having this moment where they're out here fishing. And truthfully, I would have no idea how to even use this net, but some of you do. 
and they're out here fishing and they're out here all night. This is their business. This is their trade. This is what they're used to. They know what, what, how to do hard work. This is what they're used to. This is what they're comfortable with. And here comes Jesus. They would have heard about Jesus, known about Jesus, but he comes and looks up to them and says, hey guys, will you come and follow me? And their immediate response is, the thing that they're comfortable with, the things that they're used to, what do they do? They immediately drop their nets and come and follow Jesus. But I think you and I can sometimes feel more comfortable with Jesus, almost like a brand to associate with rather than actually saying, no, I'll be a faithful follower of Jesus. It's easy to click the follow button on social media and say, I'll follow, I'll even put Jesus on my bio on Instagram sometimes. I'll even tell maybe a little Facebook post about Jesus. I feel okay associating with him, but I'm not gonna be an actual faithful follower of Jesus. Often we will follow Jesus with terms and conditions. We'll follow Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, I'll follow you, but don't actually touch my bank account. I'll even tip you sometimes at church, but don't ask me to actually tithe. Jesus, I'll follow you, but don't actually ask me to give forgiveness to that person who really hurt me. Jesus, I'll follow you, but don't actually ask me to consider what my search history looks like on my phone. Jesus, I'll follow you, but don't ask me to date in a certain way or have relationships a certain way. Jesus, I will follow you, but fill in the blank. My friends, I've come here today that the grace of God is on offer, that you don't have to strive and work hard by your own power, but if you ask the Holy Spirit to help you, He will touch every aspect of your life and become a faithful follower of Jesus, that you don't have to try by the might of your grip. Let me try to do this, but my friends, would you release control and say, Jesus, I will follow you. I love Peter and Andrew. They drop their nets immediately. They say, my career, it's yours. My time, it's yours. My money, it's yours. They come and follow Jesus. And how do they respond and how do they live? And as we bring this to a close, and Josh said, if I finish this on time, you might buy me some free lunch so the band can come up on stage. (laughs) We're gonna land the plane. But I love looking at the story of Peter because he's an ordinary man like you and me. I love reading through the Gospels and watching how the disciples do life with Jesus. They see the miraculous. They see incredible things take place. They see the blind eyes open. They see miraculous stories take place. They see these pinnacle moments. But they also see these very ordinary moments. They're following Jesus. They're eating meals with Jesus. They're laughing with Jesus. They spend years together. And then like we're about to go on this journey over the next week in the, in the lead up to Easter, we read about in the gospel accounts the story of when Jesus ultimately would journey towards a cross and Peter would ultimately follow Jesus to his death. That he watches Jesus be killed. He watches Jesus be mocked and bruised and beaten and tortured. And Peter in those moments would even deny knowing Jesus. He would be, feel hopelessness and broken. And Could you imagine if you had given up everything to follow this guy and all of a sudden right before you, it's all crumbling down. The man that he's following, the man that he's dropped his nets, his safety thing, and he's saying, I was following this guy and now there he is hanging on a cross, taking his last breaths. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, hopeless, broken, hurting. But here he is watching the guy that he'd followed, taking those final breaths. And he goes off. Jesus takes that final breath and dies. The disciples kind of scatter. They're freaking out. We've been following this guy. It's all falling to pieces. We know how the story goes that three days later, Jesus doesn't stay dead, but defeats death and is alive. And I love reading the interactions with Jesus after His resurrection. Because you know, Easter is not just about a cross. Easter is about an empty tomb. Easter is about the resurrection life in Jesus. Easter is about the eternal hope that we have in Him. And we see the firsthand account and the gospel stories of a moment where Jesus starts appearing to His disciples and it starts to click. 
because Jesus goes from not just being a morally good teacher that got some people to follow Him, but He is the risen Saviour. He's the one that says, wow, I will follow you. He's the one that our hope is in. He's the one that will transform and change lives and the disciples see it with their own eyes. There's a story you read at the back of John that Peter is feeling this moment of despair and brokenness and he comes up and he's going back to what he's comfortable with. He's out there fishing again. And Jesus appears to him again. He's defeated death. And he has an interaction with Peter, essentially restoring his identity to him. And it all starts to click for Peter because he, well, in that moment, starts to realize, man, Jesus called me to drop my nets. But what was the second part of the promise? Follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. The promise is that I will not make you but do it all by yourself, do it all alone. No, He says, I will make you a fisher of men. And so what does Peter do? The thing that he was comfortable with, fishing for fish, it starts to click. The man from Galilee goes on to being one of the founding fathers of our faith. The boldness that rises within Peter, the hope that rises within Peter because his Saviour is alive. And so it begs us the question today, my friends, how will we respond? The call of Jesus is simply to make disciples. That's the call and I'll offer an invitation today. The disciples are gathered with Jesus and He gives them the great commission. Go into all the nations, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I will be with you. The disciples have this confidence that they've seen the risen Saviour and majority of them will go on to ultimately die for their faith because they were so confident in the thing that they believed in. And I wonder today if we will go from maybe nominal Christianity or kind of just, it's kind of a, a good thing to do, but no, say our chips are in and we will follow you, Jesus. Would you see the significance of the call because of the one who makes the call? Would you see the significance of this moment that Jesus is not just far off removed, but His presence is here today and the call has gone out to you and to I, that it will touch every aspect of your life. That maybe your marriage feels like it's on its last breath, but I just believe because of our risen Saviour, in a moment, redemption can take place. I just believe maybe your child has ran far away, but just in a moment, God can move. Maybe you feel like there's such darkness in the city, but just as you leave today, you can say, man, there's hope within me because the Kingdom is at hand and I see my risen Saviour and it will touch every aspect of my life. What will take place in the city of the Sunshine Coast? What will take place in the schools? What will take place in the universities and the workplaces? As a community of faith, say, man, we are following our King and His Kingdom is at hand and I will follow Jesus and make disciples. It's not for just the elite of the day, but it is for you and for I today. This is really good news. But I think some of us may have brought a lie because in a room like this, there are often men and women, students, maybe the adversaries convinced you that you have too many shortcomings and you have too many weaknesses and too many fallings to be used mightily by God for His Kingdom. Or maybe not even you that feel useless, but you don't feel useful because of your mistakes and the difficulty that you've walked through. But I wanna remind you that if you believe that, that that would be a lie from the enemy, that because of the beauty and the truth of God's Word, that our shortcomings and our weaknesses, the things that we feel like maybe aren't that good, is the exact tool that God wants to use to show His power and His glory and His strength most clearly through you. So today as a community, we rejoice in the areas of weakness. We rejoice in the areas where maybe we don't have it together because He is a Redeemer. He is a Restorer. He's a hope giver. He gives purpose to you today, my friends. So you can go home today saying, man, this week's gonna look different. My school is gonna look different. My workplace is gonna look different because I don't have to have it all together. I put on a fake facade, but this is the real me. This is me. Shane Duffy, who you heard a moment ago is, I'm crying because Shane's probably going to watch it and I love the guy so much. But he said this to me when I had kids. He said, you think you're going to teach your kids a lot, but you're actually going to learn more from them than you ever teach them. And it's just turned out to be so true to me. In this journey of wanting to start a church and feeling like God is leading us to go, I've watched my oldest boy, Eli, live by faith. 
He in his own way has started dropping his nets. I've watched my boy say goodbye to his toys. I've watched my boy say goodbye to the things that he's familiar with, his friends, his school. I've watched him say goodbye to his bedroom, to his house. And he's dropped his nets in his own little way. But a few weeks before we jumped on the plane to move, he came up to me and said this just out of the blue. He said, Daddy, we are following Jesus to Australia to start a new church. Just this little boy with a little bit of hope and a little bit of faith. And it did something in his dad to say, yes, we are, son. It's not us by our might, but no, we are following Jesus. This little boy's little faith is like the thing that I'm holding on to. Like, yes, it's scary to go to Melbourne and start a branch of church. Like, who does this? Like, it's scary. Like, how do we pay the bills? How do we find a house? When I ask people where we're gonna live, they're like, where are gonna live? Well, I don't know, apparently there's a housing crisis. I got a little twitch in my eye, like someone help me. But just the security and comfort of knowing, no, we're not going because this is our scheme or our idea. No, we are following Jesus. He's the one that's gonna take care and He's the one that's gonna provide. And so I come to you today, friend, and ask you the question, where is the area that you need to come and follow Jesus again? What's the thing that He's poking and prodding at? What's the thing that He's saying, hey, would you drop the nets? You're trying to do it by your own might. You're trying to do it by your own power. And come and follow me. I pray that we would see the Sunshine Coast one for Jesus. And I don't think that's just wishful thinking. I think that's a promise of Scripture, that the Kingdom of God is coming. We're not just living as an escapist, like, whoa, it's pretty bad out there. No, we're saying, no, we are Kingdom men and Kingdom women. We have hope and victory in Jesus. And so I wonder what would it look like for you to flip the script in your mind that your business is a Kingdom vessel that the employees that you leave, businessman or businesswoman, you can actually see a kingdom impact in their lives. It's not just trying to make some money. You can have a kingdom generosity flow from your business. Maybe you're a school teacher out here and you're not just trying to check the box and deal with these crazy kids. No, you actually bring the kingdom of heaven into your classroom. For your marriage, what if it was, man, we're just fighting all the time. No, let me do one, outdo one another in honour and love and service. Would we be the kind of people that say we will follow Jesus? The Kingdom is at hand and we will make disciples in the most simple of ways. So I'd love to pray for you and we'll bring our time to a close. If you don't mind bowing your heads and closing your eyes. Friend, maybe you've been here today and you've heard me talk about this King and His Kingdom, but you don't actually know Jesus. I believe there's an opportunity for you right now in this moment to know Him. You don't have to jump through hoops, clean yourself up, but because of what we've celebrated, that Jesus came from heaven to earth, lived a perfect life, died upon a cross, took the penalty of sin upon Himself, so that if you and I believe in Him and confess with our, our hearts and our mouth that He is Lord, we will be saved because friends, He is alive today. Now I'd love to pray for you if you're out there. I'm not gonna point you out or embarrass you. I would just love for you on the count of three to raise your hand high in the sky so I know you're out there to pray for you. And as a sign of faith towards God that you're saying, I want a relationship with you. So friend, if that's you, if you're in a relationship with Jesus, would you raise your hand on the count of three? One, two, three. All across this room, I see one hand reaching out. It's amazing. Is there anyone else? Come on, praise God. There's two. It's incredible. Is there anyone else? Would you raise your hand? It's amazing. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anyone else? It's incredible. You can put your hands down. Praise God. We're going to pray all this prayer out loud together. Church family, would you join us in this? Dear Jesus, thank you for coming from heaven to earth and living the perfect life and dying upon a cross for me. And I put my faith and trust in You and I will follow You. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Come on, can we celebrate those people reaching out right now? It's amazing, praise God. And for the rest of us, would you, would you join me in standing in a moment? I'd love to pray for every single one of you as we bring our time to a close. If you feel comfortable, would you just reach out your hands as a sign of surrender? Well, let's pray right now. Dear Jesus, I thank You for this community, God. I thank You for the marriages represented here, God. I thank You for the children that are represented here, God. I thank You for the workplaces and the businesses, the, the friendships that are represented here. And I pray that You'll see a community of people saying, yes, Jesus, we will follow You. So God, I pray as people leave today, they'll feel the peace of God. 
God, I pray for freedom in this place. God, I pray that they'll know that You are with them in the hardship and the challenge. And I pray for Your miracle working power to come across this room and we would see the Sunshine Coast experience the reality of the Kingdom of God. And God, I pray for the best days ahead of Anthem Church. God, I pray that the sound of this house and this people would echo through the streets and in the homes and the workplaces and we would see Your Kingdom come and Your will be done. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen. Come on, why don't we thank Josh and Taylor for being with us here today. What a great word. And just, I don't know about you, but I'm just stirred to go all in. What would it look like to go all in? Like what would it look like to actually bring Jesus into every area of our life? Like, you know, so often we segregate the, our faith component. And I, I love the fact that God's put people in places of influence in our community. Like men, God's got yeah, his, his hand on you. And there's a new season of influence you're stepping into. And I just love the fact that you're taking Jesus into those spaces. I look around the room today and there are people who are called to different spheres. Let's go all in. Come on, let's go all in. And let's see what God can do in and through a community of people who live like that. Hey, you were handed this when you walked through the doors. Uh, hopefully it says you are invited. Firstly, you are invited uh, to join us next weekend. But I'm giving you these so that you can take them home to your workplaces, uh, to your schools, and maybe to put them in the hands of your neighbours and invite them to our Easter service. The statistics tell us that four out of 10 people, uh, if they were invited to come to church on Easter Sunday would come. So there's a 40% strike rate you've got. So if you ask 10 people to come, you're gonna get four people who are gonna come to church next weekend we're going to preach the gospel together and then we're going to believe God that we're going to disciple a generation of people we've already seen over 50 people make decisions this year to follow Jesus come on that's that's actually significant and across this weekend uh, you know I think another eight people have made a decision to place their faith in Jesus Christ isn't that amazing uh, and so if you are one of those people across this weekend I want to ask you to do something really brave before you leave this room I know we've got a few minutes over but before you leave this room please tell the person that you came with about the decision that you've made. And if you didn't come with anyone, I promise you we have a very friendly church and you can turn to the person next to you and tell them about the decision, you, decision that you've made and then visit the New to Faith table at the back. We have a Bible for you. We have a gift for you and we want to walk with you on that journey of faith. Thank you so much for giving us a little bit of extra time today, church. It's been a good day in church, hasn't it? We, we've helped plan a church. We've dedicated the children to the Lord. We've heard the Word. We've been stirred in faith. If you need prayer for anything, our team is here. Our altar is open. Uh, let's uh, head out and let's connect as a community this week. God bless you. Thanks for being here this morning. Amen.